Chapter 9 The Plotters Ah, a friendly face at last! Ramana jumped at the sound of the distinctively plummy voice and gave a sigh of relief as the new arrival revealed himself, for this was an infinitely more reassuring presence than a returning Ogron. Mr. Stokes, you made me jump! He waved a hand. I must apologize. I didn't intend to give you a fright. Ramana noted the genuine contritions in his voice. He walked into a shaft of light and she saw the streaks of grime that covered his big, sweaty face and the disarray of his clothing. His suit, which had never been immaculate, was torn in places and the collar of his shirt was askew. Alas, he went on, I was overcome by enthusiasm at the sight of your prettiness. He blew out his cheeks and sat down on a ledge that formed a perfect seat in the rock. What is that curious object? He asked, indicating the inert canine. Never mind about him, Romana said hurriedly. Tell me, what happened to you? Stokes wiped his forehead and smeared an even longer greasy streak across it. It was horrifying, my dear, he said. I was ruminating in my cell when I heard screaming and shouting. And shots! Then the door of my cell opened by itself and they were telling us to evacuate. For a moment I thought I'd land myself in the middle of a breakout, until I saw one of those brutes with the guns. He shuddered. Ugh. Well, of course everyone started running for the escape capsules or the transmat, including myself. Except I got lost, didn't I? You know the station well enough to find your way about, surely? Asked Romana. Oh yes, I know it very well, when the lifts are working. But all those stairs! He took a dirty handkerchief from his pocket and coughed into it. Goodness, yes, with those hairy monsters lumbering about. I haven't run like that for many years. Romana felt he deserved an explanation. Yes, well, these creatures are called Ogrons. They're a slave race. At present, they appear to be working for the Nisbits. Stokes's red face blanched white in less than two seconds. The Nisbits? The Psychotic Brothers? Romana shrugged. I suppose so. The artist lurched to his feet and started to wring his hands. And I didn't believe things could get any worse. This is appalling news. He looked about at the catacombs. I don't know whether my bladder can stand all this. I hope it can, said Romana, because I think the doctor's been captured by them, and we have to rescue him. A thought struck her. And Zaius is involved as well. She somehow reincarnated herself using the mask you made for her. I won't say that's any more impossible than anything else that's happened today, Stokes said. In fact, it seems almost reassuringly ordinary. He shook his head. Oh no, my dear, he told Romana. I'm afraid I'm not trained for this sort of thing. No doubt. Romana had to admit that Stokes was more of a liability than an asset. But I'm afraid we've no choice. We have to rescue the doctor. Stokes backed away. I don't think so, my dear. I know he meant a lot to you, but if the doctor has fallen foul of the Nisbets, there is every likelihood that his internal organs are now scattered in small, grisly portions. And I, for one, have no intention of joining him in that fate. I've often stated that the kidneys belong inside the body. He straightened his collar and started to walk away. Goodbye, my dear. I hope that your venture brings you success. Romana watched him depart. It's best if we stick together, she called after him. Stokes! But he had gone without a backward glance. She returned her attentions to K-9. The breakthrough was near, she was certain. A green light showed that his power distributor links were almost powered up. Theoretically, he could come back online at any moment, as long as nothing else had been damaged. Stokes came crashing back through the catacombs. Romana jolted upright, terrified that he had led the Ogrons to her. What are you doing? She whispered as he stumbled towards her. He pointed directly behind him. It's coming! He gasped at last. One of those great, hairy Ogrons! Ogrons, Romana corrected. Whatever they're called, it's right behind me! He blurted. I bumped into the blessed thing. It's huge, covered in long, filthy, coarse hair. Ugh. You idiot, cried Romana as they heard the sound of approaching steps. You've led it here. She looked around, but there was nowhere to run. The footsteps grew nearer. Spigot emerged into the light, smoothing back his long, permed hair and trying not to look too ruffled. 
All right, then, he greeted them confidently and lit a cigarette. I think it's about time we got this mess sorted out, don't you? Zaius observed her allies closely. Eddie was looking up at the high ceiling of level two of the station. Inscribed in gilt letters was a scroll that detailed the achievements of the Uva Beta Uva State since its foundation almost 200 years ago. Look at that. We could strip that lot, make a fair few bob. He squinted up at the letters. I can't make it out. Charlie glowered at him. It's in Latin, he said. What's that then? It's the language the Romans used to speak. Besides, three grand of synthagold ain't nothing on three mil of the big B. Quite, Zaius gestured ahead. Let us hurry, please. As they walked on, she looked approvingly at the deserted corridors and passageways and at their escort of two ogrons. Perhaps I was hasty in my opinion of your new slaves. They have done well to clear this place of the normals. Charlie nodded. They're not bad lads. Where did you come by them? Eddie answered. After the firm was broken up, we were on the lookout for some new muscle. We got them cheap in a job lot from the labor pits. What Edward means to say, said Charlie, is that we purchased the Ogrons for a competitive price from the auctions on Galoris. Their previous owners had run into a spot of bother. They were planning to invade the galaxy, but some bloke blew half of them sky high, and they had to sell up. Charlie got us the ship into the bargain, said Eddie. It used to belong to a war fleet, you know. Oh, really? said Zaius. Yes, but it isn't a patch on what we're used to, though. We had a luxury class star yacht, you know. The Stella Caprice. Gone like all the rest of our stuff when we were grassed up. Charlie stopped and turned. Eddie, you know I don't like you talking about the old days. They had now almost reached the control center. Zaius had another question to ask. The man who betrayed you. You never met him, yet you trusted him. I always wondered, why was this? He was a good contact, plenty of inside knowledge. We communicated in code on pirate satellites. He always fixed things for us, told us if the coppers were sniffing round. In return, he got his cut. 30% being down the credit line to an untraceable Platinum Town bank account. He called himself Sentinel. Charlie's hands clenched. The lion scum put the law onto us. He must have got greedy for the price on our heads. We had to break up the firm and run. None of our mates got away. Tony, Frankie, Dylan the Leg, all gone to the particle reverser. It is good that you understand hatred for this sentinel, said Zaius as they reached the door of the control center. Hatred is the purest, strongest, most beautiful force in the universe. The door to computer control was flung open from the inside and Pierpoint staggered out. She'd been wondering where he got to. He straightened himself and their eyes met. Well, he said with surprising calm, I'm waiting for an explanation. Zaius threw her head back and laughed. Gentlemen, <laughs> allow me to introduce High Archon Pierpoint. The reversing judge, Charlie said. You pass sentence on my thumb, old man. Pierpoint faced him squarely. I will do so again. It is my duty. Eddie reached inside his jacket and pulled out a compact black blaster. Can I have him, Charlie? He pleaded. Zaius stepped forward. No. I have good reason to hate this man also. It was he who sentenced me to death. She stared at Pierpoint. I want him to suffer the ultimate humiliation before he dies. Why not? said Charlie. He came closer to Pierpoint and fixed him with his fiercest stare. Benog, he ordered the nearest Ogron. Take this old fellow back to the ship and put him with the other one. In the guest suite. The Ogron grabbed Pierpoint by the scruff of his neck. No guest suite on ship, Mr. Charles. He said, confused. The crew quarters. 
Benorg nodded and grunted, his huge yellow teeth and rotting gums visible as he gave the Ogron equivalent of a laugh. <laughs> Guess sweet, it is a funny joke. Shut up and obey your orders, Charlie said. Benorg quieted immediately and set off back down the corridor, almost dragging Pierpoint along behind him. Zaius returned her attentions to the door of computer control. Now to business. We must set a course for Planet Eleven. Hold on. Why don't we take our own ship? Zaius said patiently. No, you would not be able to land on its boggy surface. We will use this station to reach Eleven, transmit down to the survey base on the surface, and then release the security on their emergency launch pad. Charlie was pleased. You've got this well planned. Good. The doctor had spent about three quarters of an hour under the watchful eyes of the sweet-toothed Ogron, and he was becoming bored. He took another look around the mess. In a corner stood a large food dispenser, of the kind that normally displays a variety of items from which the user makes a selection. This one appeared to contain nothing but meat pasties. Excuse me, this machine. There's nothing in it but pasties. The Ogron nodded. We like pasties. Good job, really. The doctor squinted at something written in small alien script further along the wall. Product of the Cathoc Empire, he read. Ha! Ah, haven't seen one of these for years. I think your masters have been taken for a ride. What do you say? Gajork asked, puzzled. The doctor was glad of the opportunity to demonstrate his superior knowledge, even to an audience this limited and uncomprehending. The Cathoc Empire he explained, was an invention of scrap merchants in the fourth quadrant. They'd had a few wars in that area and were left with bits of old spaceships and not a lot of people left to sell them to. So they jammed all the bits together, spun some tale about a fallen empire, and sold them off to gullible souls in surrounding space. All very underhanded and dangerous, of course. He patted the wall gently. These things tend to fall apart rather easily. Gajork frowned. Ship is good. You, be quiet. The door of the mess slid open and Pierpoint was thrown in. The doctor hurried to his side and pulled him up. Another Ogron stood in the doorway. Gajork, he said. Here is another prisoner. We must look after him. Are you all right, old chap? The doctor asked Pierpoint. The old man straightened his clothes. I believe so, he wrinkled his nose. What is that appalling smell? The doctor watched as Gajork and Benork sauntered over to the food machine and removed their rations. Pasties, warm beer, and Ogron doings, he told Pierpoint. He looked the judge in the eye. This is all a bit of a dog's breakfast, isn't it? They've rampaged through the station, Doctor. I think nearly everyone has got out, either by transmat or in the escape capsules. He bit his lip. Your security isn't very good, is it? The doctor pointed out. Perhaps you should have listened to us, eh? Pierpoint pinched the bridge of his nose. You are a police investigator, Doctor. I have learned to distrust members of your profession over the years. The Doctor noticed for the first time how angry Pierpoint appeared, as if he was forcing down a torrent of rage. He had lost his career and nearly his life in the space of a few hours, but his concern seemed to be directed at something else. Something that wasn't yet clear. The involvement of the Nisbet brothers, said the doctor, has come as something of a surprise. Indeed, Pierpoint said quietly. But I happen to have overheard, the doctor said confidentially, the details of their alliance. Pierpoint became more alert. Yes? The doctor outlined what he had heard about Zeus' promise to lead the Nisbets to a rich seam of Belzite on Planet Eleven in return for the use of their mining equipment. When he had finished, Pierpoint closed his eyes and sighed. She is lying to them, he told the doctor. There can be no Belzite on Eleven. It's quite impossible. The entire planet is next to worthless. That's common knowledge. The doctor rubbed his chin. So what's she really after, eh? Romana had moved back to the cavern where the TARDIS had materialized. It was easier for her to work on Canine in the Light. She and Stokes were being treated to Spigot's account of his escape from the Ogrons. 
I was glad of my training, I can tell you. Of course, training on its own's nothing. Instinct's important. He stubbed out his cigarette on a rock. I guess that's my strength, and perhaps my weakness too. Follow your nose and it might lead you to your prey, or you might get it cut off. I'm not sure how much of this I can stand, said Stokes. Spigot misunderstood. Try not to get too uptight. I've figured my way out of worse situations than this. This is the easy side of my life. He ran a hand through his hair. It's on the emotional side of things that my talents aren't suited. Take my wife, Angie. I lost her, didn't I? Screwed the whole thing up. Yes, I'm sure your marital history is fascinating, Stokes said rudely. But at present, my thoughts are perhaps, oddly, rather more preoccupied with my likely demise at the hands of those Orgon things. Romana looked up from her work on K-9. Orgons. To her delight, the word brought about a response from K-9. His head raised, his audio sensors twittered, and he said, Orgons, simian humanoid ectomorph, homo organalis, natives of high-gravity planet known as Bra. Located in the outer extremity of Earth's galaxy. Romana couldn't help putting her arms around the metallic animal. Okay, Nine, it's good to have you back. Sentiment reciprocated, mistress. Stokes crouched down next to K9. This is your idea of a weapon? What effect do you imagine that will have on the Nisbet brothers? Do you expect them to die laughing? Rather put out, K9 extended his nose laser. A bright red beam shot out and blasted a chunk of rock from the wall behind Stokes. He leapt up. Uh, perhaps I was rather hasty in my judgment, uh... K-9. The dog said proudly. Mistress, I am now fully recharged and ready to assist you. Good boy, K-9, said Romana. How are your sensors? Do you think you can locate the doctor for me? She looked on as K-9 started to turn a circle, his antennae buzzing. It's no use. That thing can't have the range. It's too small, Spigot said. I don't consider it wise to underestimate K-9, Stokes reminded him. His little nose ray certainly seems like our biggest asset at present. Survey completed, mistress, K-9 reported, coming to a standstill. The Doctor Master is located inside the spacecraft docked to this station. How is he, K-9? His heartbeats are steady, mistress. Romana looked up triumphantly. I was right. The Doctor is alive and well. He's on the Nisbet Brothers' ship, love, said Spigot. I don't call that alive and well. I call it alive and being saved up for the toenail job later on. Romana turned back to K-9. Listen, K-9, I want you to clear away to the TARDIS. She indicated the blocked entrance. Orders accepted. K-9 motored eagerly forward and started to blast away the rocks. Romana stood up. I'm going to rescue the Doctor. Are either of you coming? Spigot and Stokes regarded each other coolly. She could tell that each was waiting for the other to speak. Uh, my dear, said Stokes, you surely can't contemplate such a mission, particularly not alone. Those ogrons will blast you as soon as they see you, said Spigot. How gallant. She turned to leave. To her astonishment, she found Stokes following her. Wait, wait, she turned. Yes? He dithered for a few moments and said, How come? He took her hand. There's something about you, Ramona, that I find rather reassuring. He shot a look back at Spigot. And if I'm going to die, I may as well do it in the best possible company. As they walked off, Spigot called. Well, good luck, but I still think you're nuts. Alone, Spigot knelt down and patted K-9 on the head. Looks like it's just you and me now. K-9 concentrated on his work and did not reply. I don't suppose, Spigot continued, a computer like you can understand what it feels like to be human. To have flaws, imperfections, all your reactions are printed on a circuit board. You'll never have trouble with the ladies, K-9. You know, it's crazy, but it's at times like this when my life's on the line that I can't stop thinking about Angie and the kids. People think that I'm tough, that I can cope just because they see me beating people up now and then, or drinking a bit. They don't seem to understand that I'm a man too, that I've got the feelings and needs of a man, that I've got a sensitive side. Spigot carried on. 
What he didn't know was that K9's audio sensors, which assessed all incoming data for relevance and possible future usefulness, had switched themselves off long ago. The screen that dominated one wall of computer control showed the Rock of Judgment's present position in relation to its new objective. Zeus sat before the row of shattered consoles, the short nails of Margot tapping navigational data into the guidance systems. Her task completed, she plucked the necessary code word from Margot's memory, punched it in, and sat back. The screen flicked through reams of computation and settled on a pattern that sneaked around the systems towards Planet 11. Zeus keyed in her ascent, and the giant thrusters embedded in the other side of the asteroid swiveled in their sockets. The floor vibrated as the new course was established. Pleased, Zeus turned to the Nisbets. All is well. We will arrive in orbit around Planet 11 in just under three hours. She flicked a button on her console, and the screen switched to a view of the station's transmat terminal. It was an unexceptional structure, with a transmission platform raised before a control panel. A couple of Ogrons stood on guard. At their feet were the bodies of workers that hadn't made it to the transmat before it fell to the invaders. Good, said Charlie. We may as well get ourselves settled in. I'll have the lads bring over the mining equipment. He took a small communicator from his inside pocket and flicked the channel open. Now, Zeus said, I wish to interrogate the investigator. I want to know how much the police know of our operation. Bring him to me. The hard stares of the brothers reminded Zeus that they were unused to receiving orders. If you would, she added reluctantly, how she loathed having to abase herself before these insects. The Nisbet brothers are mutants themselves, Pierpoint told the doctor. Recessives. They are allowed to live in certain areas, but they are not permitted to vote or associate. Then it's no wonder they're so impolite. The doctor sat on the floor of the mess, staring into space. He clicked his fingers. Worthless. What is worthless? Helicon. Everyone knows it's worthless. They mix it with balls ore and use it to line pipes. I know that. Pierpoint said patiently. Exactly, the doctor cried. You know it. I know it. Everyone knows it. Apart from Zeus. Because to her, it's the most valuable thing in the universe. It's given her a kind of immortality. Although I'm not sure how. Kajork, who had been listening to orders on his communicator, strode over to him. You stand. You are wanted by Zeus. Ah, well, it's always nice to feel wanted. The doctor stood. Let's go. My feet hurt. It must be all that sitting down. He was let out by Gajork. The doctor was dragged along the deserted corridors of the rock by Gajork. A further set of instructions from Zeus, relayed over the communicator carried at the Ogron's belt, directed them up to level 8. They passed the rows of cells, empty for the first time since their construction. If he had been a lesser man, the doctor might have grown fearful at this point, but dungeons had long ago ceased to worry him unduly. At the end of a long and straight metal corridor, Gajork lurched forward abruptly and bundled the doctor through a door set into one wall. It was a small and unimpressive door that led to a large room as bare and gray as everything else in this area of the station. It contained a row of seats and a platform upon which stood Zeus. Her hand rested onto a large metal chair that had been bolted onto the platform. Directly above it was a funnel-shaped structure that was bolted to the ceiling. The room was antiseptically clean, but it contained a sharp, sweet odor the doctor recognized immediately as the smell of death. Hello, said the doctor. We must have a chat. Zeus hissed. Do you recognize this chair, investigator? Please, call me the doctor. Investigator sounds far too formal. He peered at the chair. I can't say I do. Is it important? She slapped him viciously across the face with the back of her hand. The blow drew blood. The doctor winced and felt the wound tenderly. I don't think that was necessary. Be thankful, Normal, she warned him, that I do not unleash my power to crush you where you stand. She ran her hand along the back of the chair. 
It was in this chair that I met my death three years ago. They say the particle reverser process is painless. That is a lie, like much of what normals say. I screamed as the rays from the reverser bathed my body and I was consumed, dissipated to the cold winds. But they had not triumphed. I survived. My soul survived and fled to the mask. The doctor raised a polite finger as if he were a keen student at a lecture. Uh, yes. I wanted a word about that, actually. We can't all have this immortality, you know. It makes a mockery of the judiciary if people they've executed keep popping up again and carrying on where they left off. Fair dos and all that. He trailed off, aware that Zaius might be about to strike him again as she came around the chair. You talk like an idiot, Doctor, she said. Why? You are not an idiot. I can tell that. Perhaps I'm just curious. I'd like to know how you pulled off that trick with the mask, actually. And about your choice of material, Helicon. No doubt you would. Zaius clicked her fingers and Gajork threw the doctor into the chair. Unfortunately, you are not in a position to ask questions. The doctor settled himself in the chair and crossed his legs nonchalantly. I don't know, this is rather comfortable. Zaius pressed a control built into a panel fixed to the wall, and the doctor found himself fixed to the chair. He cried out as a beam of force gripped him. With a tremendous effort, he managed to speak. Ah, uh, force field! Which will at least still your flapping tongue. To the doctor's pain senses, her voice seemed to come from far away. Unless you answer my questions, doctor, I will operate the reverser. Every last atom of your body will be inverted, your blood will bubble, your brain will expand until it seeps through your skull. Your suffering will be amusement to me. My hate is stronger than you could comprehend. The doctor cried out, I'll answer your questions. I didn't say I wouldn't. He twisted his head painfully in an attempt to face her. Pardon me for saying so, but you seem to take considerable pleasure in your work. She trailed her fingertips almost tenderly across his wounded cheek. Oh, foolish normal. With your idiotic humor, I am going to make you scream for death. And Ogron paced up and down outside the docking port leading to the Nisbet brothers' ship, his rifle raised. Occasionally, he yawned and revealed his black tongue and rotting teeth. Stokes and Romana crouched at the entrance to the previously concealed docking port and looked down at the sentry. Their lack of armament did not inspire Stokes' confidence. We should have brought your computer, he whispered. Romana shook her head. One Ogron shouldn't be too much of a problem, I hope. Their evolutionary pedigree is rather fascinating, actually. Yes? Hmm. The climate of their planet went through a series of rapid changes. All the evolutionary paths they took got confused. Their instincts are a mixture of primate and carnivore. They're even more jumbled up than your own species. She emerged from hiding and hopped nimbly down to the entry hatch. Stokes, terrified, shook his head at her gall. The girl was certainly brave as well as beautiful. He watched as the Ogron observed her approach and raised his rifle to cover her. You, girl, he shouted. Stop or I fire. Don't you know who I am, she said haughtingly. The Ogron, who must, thought Stokes, be accustomed to being pushed around, cowered and lowered his weapons and shook his head. I am Zaius, Romana shrieked, outraged. The partner of your masters, the Nisbet brothers. Now stand aside and let me pass. The masters say no one allowed in ships, the Ogron protested weakly. They will be displeased if you do not let me pass, Romana blustered. Now, will you obey me? You know of my power to kill with one glance? The Ogron muttered feebly and scampered aside. Romana summoned Stokes, his heart in his mouth. He came forward and stumbled past the Ogron. I, I, I'm with her, he stammered, rather spoiling the effect. The dark entranceway of the ship gave on to a central corridor that ended in a flight deck with doors leading off to either side. There appeared to be nobody about. Stokes and Romana crept along the aisle trying to step as lightly as possible in case their presence was noted. 
I cannot believe I am doing this, Stokes whispered. If yesterday you had given me the choice between breaking into the Nisbet Brothers' ship or hacking off one of my own legs with a rusty saw, I definitely would have taken the latter. He noticed a rack of weapons built into the wall. Romana took down one of the compact rifles used by the Ogrons and looked it over. High impact, high range energy weapon. Causes displacement of internal organs through narrow channel photon bombardment. Don't go on. I feel queasy enough as things stand, Stokes protested. Ah, but there's a stun setting, Romana pointed out. That could come in handy. She flicked the catch off the rifle and walked towards the nearest door. Stokes followed, peering over her shoulder. A transparent panel revealed a storeroom that contained several boxes and large metal containers. Romana walked onto the next door and looked into that. Don't tell me. It's a torture chamber. Stokes muttered, his knees knocking, replete with every device of agony known to humanity, and a few more besides. Romana beckoned him over and pointed through the panel. Stokes looked and saw Pierpoint sitting cross-legged on the floor. Standing on the other side of the large, dirty gray room was an armed Ogron. It's the old scratcher, said Stokes. Trust him to survive. He was alarmed to see Romana's hand reaching for the door control. Create a diversion, she ordered him. He would have protested, but the door was already open and the Ogron was lumbering over. Who are you? What do you want? It demanded. Stokes fumbled for an explanation. I, I I'm an old friend of the Nisbet brothers, he stammered. I, I thought I'd just, uh, 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 drop in. The Ogron looked him up and down. You do not look like friend of brothers. Trust my luck to get the clever one thought Stokes. Yes, they said do pop round if you're ever passing. He tried to think of something else to say, but his mouth merely opened and closed a few times. His eyes kept flicking down to the Ogron's rifle. Fortunately, this diversion was all that Romana needed. She leapt through the door and fired her stun charge at close range to the Ogron. He was knocked back and his rifle fell from his grip. The ape floundered on the floor, his eyelids fluttering a few times before they closed at last. Pierpoint sprang up nimbly. He stared at Stokes, who was fanning away the fetid air. What are you doing aboard this ship? Rescuing you, you ungrateful old idiot, Stokes said. You can thank Ramona for that, of course. If the decision had been mine, I'd have left you here in the lockup, giving you a taste of your own medicine, as it were. Romana addressed Pierpoint. What's happened to the doctor? He stooped over to scoop up the weapon dropped by the Ogron and settled it in the crook of his arm with ease. He was taken for interrogation. There was nothing I could do. Stokes threw up his arm. Interrogation? Oh dear no. Right now the poor old doctor's probably lying half in, half out of a bath with electrodes dangling over the water. That was one of the firm's favorite methods as I recall. He rested a protective hand on Romana's shoulder. I really shouldn't discuss such things in front of you, should I? Try not to be too upset. She removed the hand. Thank you, but I shouldn't worry. The doctor's been interrogated before. I think he enjoys it. Listen. Pierpoint was at the door, looking down the corridor and out of the ship. In my office, upon level 9, there's an emergency beacon. Only I know the combination that will activate it. What good will another silly old signal make? said Stokes. Pierpoint angled the tip of his newly acquired rifle slightly towards Stokes and spat. It will transmit our exact position to the nearest police patrol. They could be with us in hours. Right, said Romana, steadying her own weapon. Let's go. She hurried from the mess. Pierpoint stalked out after her. Why do we have to do all this rushing about? Stokes complained as he panted along the corridor after them. Can't we stop and have a rest somewhere? But the others were not listening. The door to computer control opened and a small party of Ogrons walked in. They carried gleaming silver crates that were marked with alien symbols. Charlie turned from the console he had been examining and inspected the equipment. Right, that lot looks all right. Three mini-rigs, a Kekison drill, and seven rubble crushers. Remembered the Atmos suits as well. Good. He stepped forward and took a small cardboard box from one of the Ogrons. Take it all down to the transmat. The first Ogron inclined his head. 
Yes, Mr. Charles. He gestured to his colleagues and they started to shuffle out. Hang on, called Eddie. What about the tea? He took a smaller box from one of the Ogrons, waved them away again, crossed to the console at which Charlie was seated, put the box down, and pressed a red button on its side. It flipped open. Inside was a steaming pot of tea, a jug of milk, sugar, and a china service that consisted of two small white cups and saucers. Gathered on a plate were a selection of icing strip fondants in dainty floral patterned paper cases and a couple of dry, tough, unsweetened biscuits. Charlie watched as Eddie poured. In the old days, before the bust, one of the firm would have carried out this task. Old Frank McGee, or Andy, the five-headed Axe Wilkinson. It would have been beneath the brothers to pour their own tea. They had tried to teach a few of the brighter Ogrons to wait at table, but the ungainly beasts had proved to be appalling butlers, particularly when serving smaller items such as new potatoes or sprouts. Charlie slipped the pudgy index finger of his right hand through the small handle of his teacup and sipped at the boiling liquid. His other hand wandered over the fancies, weighing the charms of one against another. It settled on a pink oblong. He nibbled the edges of icing from the sponge. He liked to save the small nobble of cream in the middle of the top to the very last and eat around it. Just think, he heard his brother say, with three million credits worth of the Big B, we'll be able to get ourselves property again. None of this HL plantation stuff. Charlie settled his teacup on its saucer and finished off his fondant before speaking. Listen to the boy, he said. It's a good thing Mum told me to look after you, Ed. Three million credits worth of the Big B, my elbow. He noted Eddie's eyes, lusting for a fondant, and passed him one of the unappealing biscuits. What, you don't think she's trying to spin one over on us? Eddie's eyes narrowed. Do I reckon? Charlie finished his tea. Do I reckon? If Dad could see you now, Ed, what would he think? He leant over the console. There's no Belzite on Planet Eleven. If there were, it'd have been stripped clear years back. And she knows about as much as our old chum Sentinel as I know about keeping goats. What, she's taken us for a pair of chumps? Eddie slammed down his teacup and bit a corner off his biscuit. Let's have her. Don't be hasty, said Charlie. Think about it. Zayus wants us to set up a little mine on Eleven, right? So there's got to be something worth her trouble down there. And if it's worth her trouble, worth waiting for us all this time, it's got to be worth a lot. I want to find out what it is. And don't think I'm going soft, neither. He reached for the other box he had taken from the Ogrons and flipped open its cardboard flaps. A row of small, dusty, bullet-shaped objects painted a dull green were inside, wrapped up in yellowing newspaper. Remember these? They're those remote blast mines you bought off that bloke at the auction, said Eddie. Charlie replaced the flaps. Right you are. Insurance. We'll set them up down at this survey base, and when we've got what we want, we can clear out. Yes, goodbye, my dear. Lovely to work with you. Perhaps we'll do it again one day. Then sit back at our leisure and blow the lot. No Zayus, no evidence, just us and the loot. Eddie sat back in his chair, amazed. And you've had this all worked out right from the start. Four years back, more or less. Charlie poured himself a second cup of tea and went for another fancy. A yellow one with butterfly wings of halved macaroon. I've waited four years for this. He took a bite of the cake. A pulse throbbed on his temple. Nobody uses the Nisbet firm.